I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritties. You can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... How a ragtag army of POW staged a revolution that saw the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the birth of Czechoslovakia. Everyone knows the stories of World War I, World War II, the French Revolution, and all the other classic historic wars taught to generations of kids in their high school history classes. But fewer know about the labyrinthian sequences of events that led to the formation of Czechoslovakia in the mid-1900s. It involves the fall of four empires, an underdog army of Czech and Slovak POWs banding together to trek 6,000 miles across the Siberian tundra, Indiana Jones-style adventure and intrigue, and the seizing, consolidating, and redistributing of power that is still having effects on the world stage to this day. Act 1. Take me out. Adventure. It's a word we hear a lot, mostly from people trying to sell us something. A movie where Ryan Reynolds or The Rock wanders around jungles and historical landmarks and bickers with people in between fight scenes where somehow no one important gets hurt. An overpriced trip anywhere but here. Some tangential product of colonialism stripped of its rough edges by distance and time. Maybe just the newest flavor of a blended coffee drink. In this era, when everyone's a critic, people sometimes make hot takes about how being a character in a big, over-the-top action thing like James Bond or Marvel Comics or The Elder Scrolls would actually really suck, what with all the killing and stealing and catastrophe stuff. But that's kind of the point. Adventure in fiction hinges on characters doing stuff we wish we could do, but don't actually want to. People love it when characters survive absolutely hellish stuff and somehow get what they want, dust themselves off, and ride out into the sunset. Tonight we'll be looking at a true story in that general mold. It's a story about a fight against injustice with the odds heavily stacked against our protagonist. And with all the trappings of an Indiana Jones-type 20th century pulp adventure. Gold, trains, the back of beyond, failing empires, the French foreign legion, arrogant German aristocrats, and their helmeted goons. Camaraderie, it's all here. We just need to start with some background and the end of an age. This isn't a story about the Hyborian Age, but tonight we'll be looking at an age that might feel just as remote and fantastical to you. Europe before World War II. This was an era when industry hadn't yet completed its transformation of the world, when peasants were still the backbone of the economy, and when the eastern part of Europe was carved up by the mighty empires. Our story begins in one of these empires. It's Austria-Hungary, seat of power for the ancient house of Habsburg, a state in decline despite its massive size and historic political power. It contains many different cultures and languages, but currently the government is trying to concentrate power in the hands of Germans and Hungarians, and push their languages to be the sole languages of the empire. Years later, a man named Gustav Beckvar recounted what it was like. In 1905, when he was 11 years old, German-Austrians held a festival in the city of Brno. The idea was to hold a holiday commemorating the unified German culture of the empire in a majority Czech city to build up a sense of shared national identity. What actually happened when thousands of Germans came to Brno was a series of riots. The police showed up to end the chaos, and it went down like this. The Austrian police, composed mostly of Germans, made no allowances for indisputed fact that the trouble had arisen out of the arrogance and unprovoked provocations of their own countrymen. They charged the angry Czechs, using their sabers freely. In one particularly fierce attack, my brother, who was trying to protect me, was struck by a mounted constable. The man savagely slashed his overcoat from his shoulder to his seat. Fortunately, he was not much hurt, but the brutal assault made a deep impression on my young mind. On the morning after the riot, we reached our Czech school to be told that we could not attend for the day because the Germans, in venting their spite upon us, had attacked the house, smashing windows and strewing the floors with broken glass, stones, and fragments of smashed furniture. He had a lot of stories like this, like when his friend's father was fired for sending his son to Czech language school rather than a German one, or how the old man in the apartment across the street would sing German military songs at them from his window whenever he thought it would annoy them. Things like this played out all across the empire in a thousand different ways for Austria-Hungary's ethnic minorities. As Beckvar put it, They'd never given us any reason to desire a closer union with the fatherland than was politically necessary. This is why, late one morning at the end of June, in the year of 1914, 
A 19-year-old boy by the name of Gavrio Princip stood outside a deli clutching a pistol. The Austrians took his homeland from the Turks 16 years before he was born, one foreign tyrant to another. Austrian and Hungarian officials made the decisions, and the people of his native Bosnia were forced to toil under feudal law, separated by their brother Slavs in Serbia by Germanic tyranny. Authorities have banned books in the Serbian language and attempted to suppress any move towards Bosnia unifying with the other majority Slavic provinces of the empire. The government declared martial law in Bosnia in 1913, when Serbian military victories against Bulgaria threatened imperial dominance of that region. Princip volunteered to fight in that war, but the Serbs turned him away. They said he was too young, too weak. Well, the empire has shown its true face now, and Gavrio is going to fight for his people in his own way. A nobleman's motorcade rolls past the deli. Gavrio Princip, agent of a covert pro-Serbian terrorist group known as the Black Hand, raises his pistol and makes history. So we got a couple pictures of Gavrio Princip here. Um, on the In the top picture, he's the guy on the far right. Uh, and then on the bottom picture, he's a little younger than in that in the previous photo. Gavio, Gavio Princip looks like a frustrated painter. I mean, either that or he looks like the lead singer of a early 2000s throwback garage rock band, which is ironic considering that the early 2000s throwback garage rock band Franz Ferdinand that's named after this event. Gavrio Princip looks like the type of guy who loves neo-folk but gets embarrassed whenever anyone else says that they love neo folk. Oh yeah, he's like a he's like a neo folk hipster. Like he he knows the real neo folk bands and anybody who's talking about that like that TikTok neo folk shit, like that's not real neo folk. That's like that's like basically pop punk with banjos. Uh Gavrio Princep looks like the type of guy who has a hat tailor. Oh, 100%. Gavrio Princep looks like the guy who assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand and starts World War I. <laughs> Gavrio Princep looks like the type of guy who uh, probably should have reconsidered that facial hair prior to doing assassinations. Oh, yeah. You got to you got to get your shit in order before some historical pictures are going to be taken of you. Like You got to make sure like this. This is this is the fit I want to have in the books. Yeah. Got to get that haircut on point prior to doing assassination. Yeah. This this little like John Waters style pencil mustache going on here. It's not it's it's just it's unbecoming of a historical figure. Like this doesn't make me want to aspire to assassinate an archduke. No. Nah, this makes me side with the archduke. Yeah, it makes me it makes me sympathize with him. Like, come on. He's just he's just he's just on a leisurely uh drive a, a sunday stroll do nothing wrong just being a duke just duking around yeah just duking around the city duke's one of my favorite fucking gi joes you know who's not my favorite gi joe weird pencil mustache yeah no yeah that's yeah he's he's more like uh he's more like a fucking uh god damn I didn't, what are the i don't i can't even think of the name to make the joke just those like shitty dollar store knockoff gi joes whatever they're called all i can think of is the stone protectors do you ever have those <laughs> It was like whenever the treasure trolls got really popular and like treasure trolls were thought of as a girl's toy. So they came out with the stone protectors, which is such a fucking weird concept. They didn't just make like boy troll doll troll toys. They came out with this thing called the stone protectors, which they were trolls. And they were basically like ripoffs of Ninja Turtles. Like they looked like the Ninja Turtles. And then they had like a like a stone in their chest. And then you could like flip this little thing on the back of their on their back and there was like literal like a little thing inside of it that would cause a spark. And so you could like flick this little thing and it would make sparks shoot out inside of this like stone in their chest. Sounds cool. Oh, dude. Yeah, I do remember these. Yeah. So, yeah, they were basically like the, the boy treasure trolls because um, they have like they have like the troll doll hair. Yeah, they're like they look like uh, they look like the turtles toys from that era, but just with like weird poofy hair. And then just for some reason, they have like stones in their chest. And you, and this, the little gimmick was that you could like flick this thing and it would like it would like sp make sparks shoot out inside of the, the chest. But yeah. He's one of these guys. He's a stone protector. The beginning of the First World War is complex. The important part of the purpose of this story is the situation in Eastern Europe. Three of the Eastern European empires, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, had non-Slavic aristocracies ruling a predominantly Slavic population. Russia, the only empire in the majority Slavic region of Europe with a Slavic ruling class, supported separatist movements in the other empires. Germany had a different view of things. 
They wanted to be politically competitive with major European powers like France and Britain, and that meant having influence that extended outside its national borders. Its plan? Middle Europa, a broad alliance of Central and Eastern European states led by Germany and integrated into one great trade and military alliance. While Russia cast itself as the defender of Eastern Europe, many of its subjects chafed under the Tsar's absolute rule. Germany would have no shortage of rebels aiding it if it were to turn against the Tsar. And the new states the rebels established in the ruins of the Russian Empire would make fine allies for Germany. The plan had precedent. After gaining its independence from Ottoman rule in the Balkan Wars, Bulgaria had aligned itself with Germany and took a German prince as its new Tsar. Germany could hope for the same if it helped other people in the East escape from the iron grip of the Russian Empire. So here we have our main players, Russia and Germany. For Russia to get what it wants, Germany needs to be out of the picture so it won't defend Austria-Hungary. For Germany to get what it wants, it needs to take down Russia's most dangerous ally, the Third French Republic. To avoid a war on two fronts, Germany needs to knock France out of the war as quickly as possible. It also needs an excuse to invade Russia. That's why when Gavrio Princip shoots Archduke Franz Ferdinand, Germany pressures Austria to declare war on Serbia, then invades Belgium. The Habsburg government had declared war without consulting its parliament or local legislatures, and it quickly established martial law in the city of Prague. The new military courts convicted between 5,000 and 20,000 people for treasonous or anti-war actions. Across the East, the war has forced the hand of all the region's nationalist movements, and the war's two sides will try to use their enemies' rebellious subjects to their advantage. In the end, all four empires in Eastern Europe will crumble. At the start of World War I, there were just three republics in Europe. Once the war ended, there were 13. But enough background. Let's meet our heroes. In 1914, a newspaper headline announced, The ancient Czech, Bohemian language still continues to be spoken in Prague. When a New York newspaper tried to explain the difference between the peoples of Austria-Hungary, they listed Czechs and Bohemians as two different ethnicities. Czechs had very little recognition outside of the empire, Slovaks even less. It would take a special kind of person to even communicate their situation inside the empire to the outside world, let alone secure foreign aid for an insurgency. They would need to be equal parts tenured professor and secret agent to even come close. Tomas Masaryk was a professor of philosophy born to an illiterate Slovak who managed farmhands on one of the emperor's estates. Tomas's social status was so low that Masaryk's father had to ask his boss's permission for the boy to go to school. So this is this is Tomas Masaryk. What, what, are we, what are we looking at here, Dave? Um, facial hair that is definitely overcompensating for a life of abject poverty because that goatee is a rich man's goatee. Yeah, he's full Colonel Sanders. Yeah, that that uh, you know someone is rich and part of the aristocracy when they have glasses that don't have ear stabilizers. Yeah, Tomas Masaryk, he he looks like he had the world's first extensive Japanese tentacle porn collection. Tomas Masaryk, Tomas Masaryk looks like the type of guy who's cosplaying as a college professor. Yeah, there's he's just a fake beard. He put his education to good use as a tutor in the city of Brno. He taught the children of Brno's chief of police, whose private library he used to pick up more languages. When the chief of police in Brno got a position as a chief of police in Vienna, Masaryk followed to continue educating the man's children. There he studied at the University of Vienna and acquired a doctorate in 1876. The next few years went very well for Tomas. While he was visiting the University of Leipzig in Germany, he met a rich American woman named Charlotte Garagu. And after a courtship that apparently involved a lot of enthusiastic discussion of books, they got married and took Garagu as his middle name in a gesture of respect. The couple settled down in Vienna and the newly rechristened Tomas G. Masaryk got a job teaching at the university. In 1882, Czech protests for self-governance led to a series of street fights between Czech and German students and the imperial government decided it would be a good idea to split Prague's Charles University into Czech and German halves. Immediately, Tomas applied for a position as professor of philosophy at the new Czech college. Emperor Franz Joseph himself personally evaluated all the nominees in a shocking display of unwillingness to delegate, and accepted Masaryk because the minister of education thought he would be a moderating element. This turned out to be untrue. In addition to campaigning for Czech and Slovak rights, Tomas also co-authored a paper proving several supposedly ancient Czech epics to be forgeries. He also wrote a series of editorials defending a wandering Jewish handyman named Leopold Hilsner against allegations of ritual murder. His writings helped get the man's sentence reduced from death to life in prison. Look, all I'm saying is Leopold Hilsner is pretty close 
to our pal Hillsmer. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember that now. That time that I posed as a as a as a Jewish guy and ritualistically murdered all those people. Good old Papa Masaryk, he really helped me out of a bind there. I, I was really, I was totally guilty of that. If we uh, look up those texts and he's talking about berries and mush, we might, uh, we might have to go on another time travel adventure. Is all I'm saying. The crazy thing is, uh, they gave me life in prison, and uh, I just stayed in the prison until they, until they just all died, and then forgot why I was there, and then they just let me out. It was a pretty crazy 300 years. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it does. Don't do the math. But that that is that is fucked up though. That like I the, uh, you know obviously we're talking about blood libel here. This Jewish guy gets accused of this very anti-Semitic blood libel bullshit, and then uh, Masaryk proves that he didn't do it. And they're like, "Oh shit, he's innocent." Okay, instead of killing him, oh, he just gets to go to life prison for life. Like that. That's so fucked up. Oh, he's innocent. Okay, then he just life in prison for the him then. He's still he's still Jewish. I mean, he's still a Jew. He he he's still a Jew. Life in prison. Gavel, gavel, gavel. He also said that Hilsner was a notorious rascal who ought long ago to have been put in a reformatory. Sounds like me. But that's a far cry from wanting someone killed. Naturally, people accused him of being paid to write an article by Jews and protested his lectures. The first time they did this, Masaryk wrote, I was not afraid to come here. I therefore ask you to hear what I have to say on the blackboard. He spent the rest of the class chalking arguments against all the allegations screamed by the crowd. Protesters would shout him down every time he taught a class, and eventually he had to give up lecturing. Sounds like the comment section of a TikTok video. <laughs> hey! Despite it all, Masaryk worked his way up the political ladder, and in 1900 he became leader and sole parliamentary representative of a minor Czech nationalist party in the imperial parliament called the Realist Party. In March of 1914, in the face of large numbers of Slavic parliamentary representatives refusing to cooperate until they achieved national autonomy, Emperor Franz Joseph I adjourned parliament and assumed dictatorial power. This was also the year Gavrio Princip shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire entered into the First World War. Now we're back where we left off. The war had just begun, martial law was spreading across Austria-Hungary, and tensions between minority parties and the imperial government were at an all-time high. While Professor Masaryk was on a business trip in Italy, the government of Austria-Hungary began to execute Czech journalists and politicians. Imperial officials arrested his daughter, Alice, and his wife, Charlotte, succumbed to depression so strong, it eventually landed her in a sanitarium. If he ever wanted to see his family again, he would need to recruit spies, help the empire's enemies win the war, and make the case for the total dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As he put it, My mind was made up for good. Austria must be opposed in grim earnest to the death. So before we move on, just just like just to kind of like as we're getting into this kind of touch on the larger the the larger narrative here and kind of like why we're talking about this story. Um, First of all, um, this was this was a an episode that was written by um, Louis Paggi, who is a recurring guest writer for the show. Um, He wrote the SCP series. And then this is another another episode he's written. And um, both he and we find this very fascinating because, number one, this story just doesn't really get talked about uh, in the sort of common historical pipeline that we tend to learn about most of like the major historical events um, surrounding the last you know few hundred years. Um, even though it was had a massive part in the greater stage of World War One and World War Two. Um, but for some reason, this particular story just kind of, I mean, not some reason, it's, it's, it, it doesn't get talked about because it's not about Americans. That's why. Uh, but um, aside from all that, the, the reason why it's really fascinating is because the scope of it is something that you, re- you usually only ever see in movies. This just doesn't, as we'll get into and as we'll find out, this just doesn't feel real. Um, because essentially what, what we're going to get into is the fact that basically there was these three guys and, uh, you know, Masaryk was one of them, and we'll talk about the other two and some other figures in it, that kind of just single-handedly engineered the end of the four major European empires and helped to unite Czechoslovakia into its own independent nation state. Um, And essentially bringing together these two groups of people that, um, you know, you know, felt culturally connected and yet were sort of like uh, the the redheaded stepchild of Europe, for lack of a better term. 
Um, and the the way that this story unfolds, it feels very like 300 like it feels like this small group of people who went up against this massive empire and somehow overthrew them. Um, and I, I just kind of wanted to set that stage that like that's kind of the, that's the really the reason why we're talking about this is because um, this is a story that is both under discussed and also just frankly unbelievable that it, that it happened this way. Yeah, it always feels like, you know how when a, the thing that's so cool about this, sh- this story is the opposite of what happens when these stories get translated to some sort of fictionalized version that we then consume as a culture. You know, like this story feels like season 72 of a TV show where it's like the, the characters we've been following are too close to the plot. They all have the answers. They all become too central. You know what I mean? It's like season seven of Star Trek or whatever, Next Generation, where it's like, does Worf need to be like a magistrate of the, you know, new Klingon Empire? Eh, I don't know. I kind of like him just being like a guy. Does Picard need to be like the central linchpin in the re uh, the reconstruction of a, this new era of the Klingon Empire? Eh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's cool that Picard is like narratively so cro- close to the the action but also you're kind of like I, I don't know I don't this I don't I don't need all of this you know what I mean or like uh, in TV shows where there's just like oh yeah and then this character and that character are siblings like in return of the jedi or whatever where it's like oh yeah Luke and Leia definitely aren't trying to fuck each other they're actually brother and sister cuz that's what we need to have have happen for the plot there's so much of that in this story that doesn't feel like it should be real and doesn't feel like it should work and these you know two or three random people end up just ascending to the point where they can dismantle a whole mechanism of oppression out of pure pure force of will and you're just like i don't know if a a human being can do that like that's a little unbelievable and then they just did like these people actually did and it's it's pretty striking yeah and it 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 also it feels like whenever you're like sitting with a, a, a girlfriend or boyfriend or or husband or wife or friend or that you live with or whatever me when you're sitting with me yes when you know, yes of course when I'm when you're sitting with your your housemate in your tree in your treehouse uh home slash uh headquarters um and and you're just like sitting you're, you're sitting in the living room or something like that together not actually hanging out or doing anything together at the moment and the person just like throws on a show that they watch or whatever and it is it's like they're in season seven of some show that you've never seen. And then you're, you start to watch it and you're just like, what the fuck is happening? Like, like it's just, it, it might as well be a different language to you because you're so confused about all the seven layers deep, like plot developments and inside jokes and like, and like accumulated storylines that you just, you literally, it doesn't resemble human life. You're just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like, I don't know that I need Tasha Yar's evil Romulan clone to come back. Maybe Tasha Yar can just stay dead. Damn, that joke fell flat on its fucking face. But yeah, all the, the but also, in all seriousness, the other thing that you said, uh, that, is, that is what's striking about it, because, you know, you, you especially now, like, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, the current state of the world and things like, you know, rise of fascism and um, you know, over overturning corrupt political systems and fixing broken or um, malfunctioning um, societal levers of power and systemic uh, um, ways in which our our culture and society functions, um, economic dis- uh, disparity and things like that. And and people talk a lot about this idea that like um, there has to be this long game reforming of these things where. People, you know, organizing and, you know, working in communities to change things at the local level over time will accrue into this slow snowballing of societal change where, like, you know, maybe our grandchildren will live in a utopian society or whatever. Like, that's that's the way that people discuss these things. And and this almost feels like the opposite, where these, like, couple of guys, they just, like, they were just like, well, I want to change this. And then they just they just like did it within their own lifetimes. They were just like they were just like mic drop bitches. Yeah, they were just like, we have no time to waste. Let's do it now. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Fuck it. We'll revolution live. Before Masaryk left Prague, he had set up a covert organization he codenamed Mafia to conduct business inside the empire. 
And from Italy, he sent his friend Emmanuel Victor Vasca to the United States to make contacts amongst its Czech and Slovak immigrant communities. One of Mafia's best recruits was the Austrian interior minister's butler, who dutifully sent Masaryk copies of any confidential document that passed through his employer's hands. Like, this doesn't, this, this doesn't sound like a real thing. This sounds like a spy movie where you're just like, but it doesn't actually happen. Like, th- like that's the thing. It's like you watch spy movies and people are like, actually, like being a spy is really boring. You just like sit there and wait for a long time. And then like, it, like this doesn't this doesn't feel real, especially when it's just the added detail that it's his fucking butler, like like this fucking evil Alfred Pennyworth motherfucker just out here like undermining. He's not even evil. He's on the right side. This this dude rules fucking love this butler this butler deserves his own butler this is what they should have made that pennyworth tv show about oh you mean pennyworth batman's butler or what was, what was the show called it was called it was so it's called pennyworth for two seasons and then the third season it was pennyworth the origin of batman's butler <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's so good I saw a billboard with that on it and I was, I was driving, we were driving, it was like in Hollywood or something like that. And I was with, I was with my wife and I just started laughing out loud when I saw that because it was so funny to see it on a billboard. It's so ridiculous and stupid. And she did not understand why I was laughing that hard. Yeah. It's (laughs) the first two seasons are just Pennyworth. And then for season three, they retitled it Pennyworth. The Origins of Batman's Butler. <laughs> that makes it sound stupid. Like that that description makes it sound stupid. Yeah. Pennyworth, The Origin of Batman's Butler. Man, that's fucking so stupid. All of the Mafia's information found its way out of Austria-Hungary to Masaryk by way of a prematurely balding Czech socialist named Dr. Edvard Benes. He was a grim, calculating man with very few friends who was born Edward and changed one letter of his name for reasons unknown. Yeah, he, just, he changed the, the U in his name to a V. I mean, reasons unknown. I know the reason. It looks cooler. He was like, I'm a big fan of churches. Yeah, where you just, yeah, they just like, I'm a big fan of those things that just like use the old style V to mean a U or two Vs to mean a W, like the witch or churches or that indie band always. It was Benes whom Masaryk entrusted with knowledge of all his contacts overseas and his numerous and extremely detailed contingency plans for possible war scenarios. These included Russia successfully invading the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but then being pushed out in a counteroffensive, the total collapse of imperial authority, or Masaryk's death. And th- this is uh, this is this is Doctor Benes, uh, Masaryk's uh, American operative. Edward Benes looks like the type of guy who stays just a little too long at the coffee shop. Yeah. Speaking of which, he looks like he looks like Pennyworth. Yeah, he does kind of look like Alfred Pennyworth. Yeah. So he was like. That's why he got that's why he picked a butler. He was like, you get it. Birds of a feather. Am I right? Butlers of a feather. Am I right? We got to stay together. We got to stick together. What do you what do you mean, sir? You know, people like us, uh, Americans? No, 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 no. Like, you know, the thing we share, um, male pattern baldness. I was going to say premature baldness. No, 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 no. I'm not going bald. What are you talking about? You know, we're butlers. You're a butler, sir. Well, I mean, not not literally like I don't actually that's not my job, but like my blood is a but is butler blood. I got butler blood running through my veins. You, you, you look at look at my face. Look at my face. You look at my face and it says one thing. Butler. That wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought that if you hadn't mentioned it. But being a butler is just my job. Like I don't love like this isn't like my this isn't like my ethnicity or like my culture. Like I, I went to college and was going to be a, a an engineer and then things went sideways and now I'm just like some guy's manservant. Like, this isn't good for me. Right. Wink, wink. <laughs> Butlers forever. Please leave, sir. I'll have your documents sent over to the sent over to Russia shortly, but I, I don't want to see you again. Please stop coming. Send a letter. Meanwhile, the Empire sent thousands of Czechs and Slovaks east to fight the Tsar. Many of them thought the war would be over quickly. Few wars in the 19th century had lasted more than a year. Accepted wisdom was that armies just didn't recover from the early defeats. Czech and Slovak resistance formed slowly. The problem began with Russia's sizable Czech and Slovak immigrant communities. At the start of the war, Tsar Nicholas tried to deport all German and Austrian males of military service age for the purpose of national security. 
Immigrants formed Czech and Slovak councils to argue that they should be exempt from this. It worked. Local Czech and Slovak councils formed the Union of Czechoslovak Organizations in Russia and negotiated with Russia for the creation of a Czech Druzina, a military unit in the Russian army composed mainly of Czech and Slovak expats. Orders would be given in their native languages and their goal would be the liberation of their homeland. To make contact with their counterparts inside the empire, four men of the Druzina, quote, brothers, as they were called, would don captured enemy uniforms, sneak behind enemy lines, spread the word of their unit to Czech independence leaders in Prague, and convince them to make preparations to aid the coming Russian invasion. The only successful member made the deception extra authentic by convincing Russian troops to shoot at him as he ran towards the Australian... Australian? Get him, mates! Get him, mates! Get him! This is one long border. That's not a border. Now that's a border. (laughs) The only successful member made the deception extra authentic by convincing Russian troops to shoot at him as he ran towards the Austrian lines. He was quickly arrested upon arrival, but convinced the authorities he was an Austro-Hungarian who had escaped Russian prison. Upon release, he met with Czech politician Karol Kramar and told him about Druzina. He then enlisted in the Austro-Hungarian army so he could defect back to the Russians and pass news of his victory to the higher ups. Like this is a this is a next level fucking on the boots on the ground shit. Uh, very scary. I don't want to do this. No, thank you. I definitely don't. But I also feel like we do a lot of episodes about people who just like try to do like crazy schemes and then just fail horribly. Like they're just they're like I have an idea for how to do this and then it just doesn't work at all and then they just completely fuck themselves over. I'm just thinking about like Charles whatever his name was the army captain who wanted to get out of going to the Vietnam War so he escaped to North Korea and then just ended up a prisoner of war for like 40 years. But these guys like they just like did it and it worked. They were like all right we're gonna do some fucking crazy James Bond shit. I'm going to run across the Russian uh, Austrian border and I'm going to have Russian soldiers pretend to shoot at me or really shoot at me with real bullets so that the Austrians are convinced that I'm a defector. And then I'm going to ingratiate myself with them. And then I'm going to enlist in the army so that I can get transferred back to Russia so that I can escape. And he did it and it worked. The 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 Czechs and the Slovaks were built different. That's why they didn't want to unite them. They're just like, these these guys are like, these guys are fucking superheroes. They're just like a, it's just like a, it's a culture of John Wicks. If we let these motherfuckers get together, we're screwed. Are you guys united? Yeah, I'm thinking we're united. It really was too. Cause like the whole, you know, John Wick, he, he went on the revenge tour because they killed his puppy and, uh, Masaryk, he, he engineered this entire thing because they made his wife go insane. He's like, you don't understand. My wife's American. They can't handle this shit. They can't handle abject fucking uh, oppression and like just death and destruction at their doorstep every day. Their, their psyches can't process it. Yeah, you don't get it. These Americans are fucking weak. <laughs> land of the free, home of the brave? No, more like land of the, they need to be a couch potato for a weekend to heal after a long Friday night. She saw one public assassination and it just broke her brain. The Druzina worked as scouts behind enemy lines. They knew the geography of the empire and its local languages, which meant they could read imperial maps, talk to prisoners in their native tongues, and predict what the enemy might do. They were good enough to convince the Russian high command to start taking volunteers from POW camps. Volunteers only, because the loyalty of an enemy soldier you force to fight for you tends to be low. Russia took a lot of Austro-Hungarian prisoners. About a third of the empire's army ended up in a Russian prison camp by the end of the war. It became an issue because the Russians had to support them. POWs would march for days to get from the front to the trains that would take them to sorting camps, where the Russians registered them and sent them to even more remote military prisons. Theoretically, prisoners and minorities would get preferential treatment over German-Austrians, Hungarians, and Germans from Germany proper. But Russia was so cash-strapped that basically no one got adequate food, clothing, or medical care. Not even Russia's own soldiers. Men on the prison trains had to beg for food from local peasants, and cold doesn't distinguish between inmate and guard. Under these conditions, the old ethnic rivalries flared up, and just about every tribe of prisoner insulted and fought every other tribe. And if you died on the trip, you'd only be buried if the ground wasn't frozen. Once you reached your destination, rats, fights, piles of corpses no one could bury, prisoners swinging moods between fury and depression, cholera, and the vast unforgiving expanse of Central Asia. Of the 200,000 prisoners sent east, 45,000 never made it home. Conditions improved in 1916. The Russian government implemented quarantines and inoculations for the sick. 
They built sanitation and recreation facilities, and prisoners were allowed to grow their own food and take jobs outside of prison. After all, they were in small towns in the middle of Russia. Where could they escape to? On one hand, their employers were legally allowed to beat them, but on the other hand, it's recorded that a few thousand POWs married local women. Get, you get uh, brutalized and attacked by your boss who just ha has like wanton legal right to beat the shit out of you, but also you get them local honeys. That's what I'm saying, baby. Them small town Russian village honeys. Dude, <laughs> them bay bushkas, get it? Bay bushkas, you know what I'm saying? Yup, yup. I'm just here, man. I'm here for that small town village life, baby. So what do you do on weekends? Go down to the crick? No, they don't have those here? That's just an American thing? Okay, moving on. But one fact stayed the same. Any way out of a Russian military prison was a good one. Meanwhile, Masaryk and Mafia kept fighting the good fight. Masaryk's business trip was in Italy to meet the dissident group called the Yugoslav Committee. He had planned to come back to Prague afterwards like everything was fine. That fell apart in early 1915 when he got a postcard from Austria. It said, the book which you want is out of print and will not appear until after the war. This was a code. It meant Imperial intelligence was after him. Any trip home would be death. Speaking of death, Dave, have you have you been experiencing ego death lately after your litany of projects have been slated to release to the public, thus concluding your years of creative search for inner peace? I'm not convinced any of these things are going to come out, so I'm I'm fine. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm purely convinced that the the Yahweh will will intervene and something will happen and I, all of these things will just never manifest. But if you want to stave off that inevitability, please go pre-order <laughs> Mary Tyler Moorhawk, my original graphic novel coming from Top Shelf, February 13th, 2024. It's kind of like Buckaroo Banzai crossed with House of Leaves. If you're into a weird esoterica cult fandom or uh the works of david foster wallace mark z danielewski or doug wildy you might like my book it's half comics and half prose uh i think it's pretty chill and it can be pre-ordered everywhere target amazon golden apple comics wherever you would like it can be found uh just google mary tyler moorhawk you'll find it I got, a, I got a better description than it's like Buckaroo Banzai mixed with House of Leaves. Hit me, hit me, hit me. It's like Die Hard, but Dave made it and it's totally different. Wow. Yeah. Considering that it has nothing to do with Die Hard at all. That's what I just said. Yeah. That's a really good pitch. Yeah. If you're into um, Pride and Prejudice, but you aren't into Pride and Prejudice, this is the book for you because it has nothing to do with Pride and Prejudice. Smash the subscribe button. Please leave us reviews and go pre-order Mary Tyler Moorhawk. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. And if you want to follow the IRL uh, musings of the Deep Cuts podcast and your your boys, Spandrew and Dave, you can follow us on social media. You can go to Deep Cuts Podcast on Facebook. You can join our Facebook group, the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group, where we talk about the show, make memes, and have a cool little community that talks about the, sh the stuff, all kinds of stuff. Um, you can join our Discord server, bit.ly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord, where we talk about the show, make memes, and play games, and other kinds of stuff. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. Um, and, uh, if you have, if you want to get any deep cuts merchandise, you can go to deepcutspod.com and click on the shop. There's hats and t-shirts and all kinds of cool deep cuts stuff with cool graphics done by some of our artist friends. Act two, secret agent man. Tomas Masaryk and the agents of mafia had passed the point of no return. Independence or death was not merely a slogan. Those were their only options. Their project had three goals. One, disseminate propaganda for Czech and Slovak independence. Two, aid the war effort against Austria-Hungary by passing intelligence to France, Britain, and Russia, the Entente as they were called. And three, create a Czech and Slovak revolutionary army. The whole concept of Czechs and Slovaks working together to create one state was Tomás's idea. As he said in Parliament back in 1907, In Hungary, we have two million Slovaks who belong to our nationality. A people of 8 million will not, without further ado, leave 2 million of its co-nationalists to the tender mercies of Magyar jingoism. It is our duty, here and on every possible, to inform this house, Austria, and the whole of the general public that the Magyars are treating our Slovaks 
in a manner which is utterly inhuman. Czechs and Slovaks had similar languages and cultures, and both lived on the northern fringe of Austria-Hungary. The best way to think about it is that Czechs were industrial, mostly Protestant, and were ruled by Austria. The Slovaks were rural, mostly Catholic, and were ruled by Hungary. As a practical matter, Czech and Slovak organizations were more powerful together. Mafia was playing the spy game, and they played hard. Many documents got smuggled in fountain pens, suitcase handles, and boot heels. Imperial agents tried to infiltrate their organization. Professor Masaryk got poisoned twice. Other Mafia agents thought it was a skin contact poison placed in his laundry. He constantly trained with the revolver he kept on hand at all times. Swiss police searched the houses of ethnic Czechs looking for anti-Austrian propaganda. Dr. Benes had seven different aliases and was arrested by French and British authorities five times as a possible Austrian agent. This ended when the foreign editor of the Times bailed him out. As he said, Before long, that fellow may be signing passports, which you will have to respect. And then he may tell our government that a certain Scotland Yard inspector at Haver is a nuisance and ought to be removed. So treat him kindly. Mafia couriers actually arranged with British intelligence to get publicly arrested and released for lack of evidence as a smokescreen tactic. Millions of dollars poured in from the Czech and Slovak communities of the USA. Dozens of publications arguing for independence circulated Europe. Independence activists got articles published in newspapers like the New York Times and The Spectator. The governments of France and Britain gave official nods towards the liberation of Austro-Hungarian minorities. Dr. Bene said of the intelligence he sent to the French, Every report makes people grateful and puts them under obligation to me. Agents of Mafia worked counter-espionage against German spies and saboteurs. They revealed a scheme by the German and America ambassador to covertly send supplies to Germany and were involved in stopping a German plot to reinstall the president ousted in the Mexican Revolution. In 1916, Masaryk and his allies created the Czechoslovak National Council to centralize all Czech and Slovak independence organizations. In effect, it was a Czechoslovak government in exile. All this would be pointless without their army, though. As Professor Masaryk said, In a world at war, mere tracks on historical and natural rights would be of little avail. All hope for that lay in Russia's Seska Druzina, but those brave men in the service of the Tsar were in a bit of a tight spot. The Central Powers, Austria and Germany's faction, were pushing deep into Russian territory. They had taken Serbia and Montenegro too. In the face of all this, Tsarist officials were trying to stop the Druzina from recruiting more POWs. No less than the mad monk Grigory Rasputin told the Tsar not to take more volunteers from the prisoner camps. There was fear in the halls of power that a Czechoslovak unit would be loyal to Russian interests. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei de Sazanov was desperately trying to keep the Druzina under Tsarist control. He saw their support of Masaryk's National Council as a threat. After all, Masaryk had written an acclaimed two-volume treatise called Russia and Europe, condemning the empire as backwards and despotic. A Czechoslovakia built under his principles would be a wide crack in Russia's control of the East. It all came to a head in April of 1916, when the officers of the Druzina declared Tomas G. Masaryk their official leader and began collecting taxes from Czech and Slovaks living in Russia. They no longer needed Russian money. They were no longer under Russian influence. He found it in the form of Joseph Durek, vice president of the Czechoslovak National Council. Durek was popular, Czech, and unabashedly pro-Russian. In February, Sazanov invited him to Russia to speak with the soldiers. Conveniently, the Tsar agreed to release all Slovak POWs two months later. Czechoslovak support for Russia was at an all-time high. Durek entered Russia claiming to be the true representative of the Czechs of Austria-Hungary. He spun a yarn about how the oppressed Slavs of Austria longed for the Tsar's benevolent rule, and how he was going to set up a new Czechoslovakian organization right here in Russia. This is Joseph Durek. He looks like a entrant into the bi-weekly dive bar look-alike competition called Are You the Real Sigmund Freud? Will the real Sigmund Freud please stand up? He looks like the type of guy who makes people call him Siggy in bed, if you know what I'm saying. And yeah, that, that is an apt description because he really does just look like Sigmund Freud. If whatever, whatever image of Sigmund Freud you have, that's what this guy looks like. He's like a, he's a bald, uh, shorter, portly man um, with a big white beard, sort of like collarbone length um, with kind of like a pointy mustache. And he's got little glasses. I don't know what you call it. Spectacles. He's got little spectacles. The time that the kind that just sit on your nose. Spandrew, zoom in on this photo. Look at his glasses. They are not just perched on the bridge of his nose. They do not have ear stabilizers. 
They have little drop down stabilizers that rest on his cheeks that protrude from the side of the lenses. Oh, I, I, see, I, thought, that, I thought that was like I thought that was like a little like chain that was coming off of him, like a little monocle. No, it, they're like weird little like cheek stabilizers. Uh, <laughs> that reminds me of <laughs> that reminds me of in the jerk, uh, the invention that he ha- that he makes where it's like the little the little like handle for your glasses in the middle where you can just grab it like that and pull off your glasses. And then it turns out that it's causing everyone to go cross-eyed and he gets, and he gets like a this huge backlash. <laughs> That's it's just like such a weird little, like, I've got an idea to keep these stable on my face. Instead of just having them go and go behind my ears like every other glasses in the fucking world, they're just going to have little little cheek stabilizers. And they, they uh, these, uh, these, uh, these dudes just, uh, the glass is different, bro. The glass is different. If that national council didn't act fast, the independence movement would split in two. Luckily, Masaryk's top man was on the case. Milan Rostislav Stefanik was the son of a poor Lutheran pastor in the tiny Austro-Hungarian town of Kasaryska. He'd gone to Prague in 1898 to study astronomy and a certain Tomas G. Masaryk had been one of his professors. He coincidentally met a young Edvard Benes while he was working in Paris in 1905. This is like the Sex and the City cast of the Czechoslovakian Revolution. Like M- Masaryk is the is the uh, is the carry, and uh, Benes is the Samantha, and then we got uh, we got what is his fucking name? Stefanik. He's the Miranda. <laughs> I, I don't remember. I don't remember what the other girl's name is, but the other one. Yeah, I don't. Who's Mr. Big in this? Who's Mr. Big? Um, I'm pretty sure Mr. Big is that butler. Even though a congenital heart defect had left him perpetually weak, he embarked on a career of globe-trotting adventure doing astronomical and meteorological studies for the French government in places as far apart as Panama and Turkestan. He'd been made a knight in the French Legion of Honor in 1914 for his services to science. So this is Milan Stefanik. So the first thing that I see, one, good-looking guy, you know, nice chin, very, uh, you know, stereotypical hero-looking guy. He's got these war medals, wearing a military uniform, got a little military hat on. He's got the lantern jaw. But but my question is, why does his military hat have, like, Christmas filigree on it? Yeah, it looks, it's a, it's a very, it's a very ornamental, decorative military hat. It's very festive. It looks like a combination of like, it looks, yeah, it looks like something that like, it looks like a military version of a hat that like Santa Claus would wear in some old painting of like St. Nicholas or something like that. And also it looks like, it, it looks like a, like a cartoon version of like a hat that a king would wear. Like not the crown, but like when they wear those hats that have like the weird like red sash on them or whatever. I don't even know. I don't know what I'm describing. I'm just like pulling from a memory that I can't even like pin, pinpoint. But yeah, yeah, it's very yeah, like he the, like uh, Milan Stefanik because his his military like uniform is very straightforward. It just looks like a, a an a, an old European military uniform. But he's like he's like he's like business down below, Christmas up top. He also looks like they cast him specifically to be the front man of this ragtag group of like weirdo intellectuals. Like the rest of these guys, not fuckable. Milan Stefanik, <laughs> little little tasty, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and it's like it's like a really good picture of him too. Like all these other photos we've been looking at of all these players in this story, they just look like these these fucking dumpy European dudes. Like Masaryk, he just he looks he's he's all fucked up. Uh, Benes looks like a balding butler, as we established. Um, Durek, he looks like he looks like fucking Santa Claus himself. He looks like the Santa Claus from the Ernest Saves Christmas movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Stefanik, he looks like a fucking 1940s adventure superhero. Yeah, like is this dude gonna be starring in the newest remake of King Solomon's Mines? Like, what the fuck? And it's funny because he because it establishes that out of all of them, he had like a heart defect that made him like very frail. Well, you know what they say about motherfuckers with uh, heart defects? They're pretty tasty because this guy, he's a little scrumptious. Yeah, he is. He is scrumptious. And it also reminds me of that movie Gattaca because that was the whole thing in the movie was that it was about these this future society where they it's essentially eugenics where they they like only like give benefits to people who are physically superior and then um Ethan Hawke's character has a heart defect and but he wants to he wants to you know get into this organization and so he like switches identities with Jude Law's character who 
was physically superior, but then he got into an accident and was left in a, in a wheelchair. I forget. I haven't seen the movie in years, but he has like his heart, his heart problem. And then he has to like run on that treadmill and try not to have a heart attack every time he does it. And then he pees. That's the big turning point in the movie is how he pees. Yeah, they fi- yeah they finally had the, the big third act twist is he prefers to pee sitting down. He's just like, <laughs> I, why, would, why wouldn't you do this? You, you want to stand up every time you're peeing? This is way more convenient. Plus, like, if you have to poop, you might, I mean, you're there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. When the war began, he'd volunteered for the newly founded French Army Air Corps, flying experimental aircraft in 30 reconnaissance missions over enemy territory. After getting shot down over Albania, he became the recipient of the world's first aerial medevac, courtesy of noted French pilot Louis Palhan. The limitations of aviation at the time meant this involved him walking a pretty significant distance still bleeding internally from the crash. See, this is the thing. There's there's just there's nothing left for us to do. All these guys got to do all the badass shit, and they like they did it all. And they're like, what? Is, there's nothing for us to do anymore. Yeah, I'm not too concerned about that. I don't I don't feel that that's a, <laughs> that's a that's not something I bump up against on a on a uh, daily basis. Is it for you? Do you feel as though uh, there's no mountain left to climb existentially? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's no, a you trend. don't. No, you there's don't. Tr- do you <laughs> there's really? A tr- there's a trend recently where people are asking guys. How often they think of the Roman Empire, and they say, and they're saying every day. And for me, it's every it's every minute, honestly. Oh my god, it's so bullshit! This is so bullshit. This is like a separate like gremlin persona that Spandrew just like dips into every like six months. Yeah, no, I I and as a matter of fact, I made a video about how everybody who says that is lying. Um, yeah, I I do not think about the Roman Empire every day. Um, and yeah, no, I I'm I'm glad that I don't have to walk. 10 miles bleeding internally to get to a medevac, the world's first medevac. I get I get airlifted out of my backyard by a private helicopter like a fucking American whenever I get injured internally. Thank you very much. He met Dr. Benes again while he was recuperating from this and began to put his high-level confections in the French military to good use. <laughs> He just joins the group and he's like, I brought muffins. Check out my pies. <laughs> you guys have not had a pineapple upside down cake until you've tried mine. He met Dr. Benes again while he was recuperating from this and began to put his high level connections in the French military to good use. In effect, he became the third leg of the Masaryk Benes Stefanik trio as the group's Slovak representative and token conservative. He didn't trust democracy as the basis for a Czechoslovak state and wanted a king. Can you imagine that? You're just like, you're you're gonna you're gonna forge a new nation from scratch. There's no reform. There's no like, how do we take the existing systemic structures of power and reorganize them? You're just starting from scratch and you're like, but I need to lick some boots. We we need someone to rule over us. I can't sleep at night unless daddy is stepping on my throat. Like that's I can't I can't imagine anyone choose like I I understand somebody being born into a a, a society and like sort of being like Stockholm syndrome and just accepting um monarchy or a feudal system as just like the way it's supposed to be or the way it, the way it is and then just kind of being like yeah you know we have a king But I can't imagine anybody starting a new nation and choosing monarchy. When he entered Russia, Stefanik got in good with the Tsar's generals. His status as an experienced French officer lent the whole endeavor legitimacy. He met with Durek and hashed out an agreement. The Russian foreign ministry moved to stop this. A foreign power was collecting taxes in Russia and attempted to take control of one of their regiments. It was a total violation of Russia's sovereignty. It was an outrage. Sergei Sazanov met with Durek and had a few pointed words with the man. In October 1916, Durek called a meeting of Czechs and Slovaks in St. Petersburg. He condemned Tomas Masaryk's quality as a leader and announced he would no longer be working with Stefanik. Opinions among his audience were split. He quickly announced that he was forming a new Czechoslovak National Council in Russia. Russian officials drafted its constitution. Its official language would be Russian. Luckily, Stefanik had an ace up his sleeve. He called a secret meeting with the leaders of the movement in Russia and presented them with a series of documents proving Durek was acting under the direct orders of the Russian government. He proposed that they kick Durek from the National Council. Durek telegraphed Professor Masaryk, demanding he either remove Stefanik from the council or he would resign. Masaryk replied that he wasn't even qualified to serve on the council, given that he was an agent of the Russian government. The Druzina was still under Russian military command, but its soldiers pledged allegiance to the National Council. This was their oath. In the name of human and national honor, in the name of everything that is most sacred to us as human beings and as Czechs and Slavs, 
In full agreement with our conscience, together with our allies, we shall fight the last drop of our blood against all enemies until we win our Czechoslovak nation complete freedom. We solemnly pledge never to run away from the battle, never to retreat in the face of any danger, to obey the command of our leaders, to honor our flag and the banner, never to beg our enemies for mercy under any circumstances, and never surrender with a weapon in hand. Sounds like the sounds like the Boy Scout salute. Except with more dudes with crazy facial hair. They'd get their opportunity to get out from Russia's control. Russia was about to collapse. In 1916, Austria-Hungary got absolutely stomped by the Russian army in an offensive led by General Alexei Brusilov. Artillery barrages collapsed 200 miles of Austrian defensive lines, and the feared Russian Cossacks pursued the rooted army on horseback. Entire regiments defected to the Russian side. A Slovak soldier serving in the Austro-Hungary army described it like this. The ditches of the roads were all filled with corpses of our people, and thus it happened that after an inglorious retreat, our whole brigade was taken into Russian captivity, excepting the commander, who, having a car, could run away faster. It's estimated the Austrian army took between 475,000 and 750,000 casualties in the Brusilov Offensive. 266,000 to 400,000 of those turned up in Russian prisons. They'd lost more than two-thirds of their manpower, and a whole 40% of their army had deserted. The Czech and the Slovak units in the Russian army proved themselves here. General Brusilov put it like this. They fought magnificently at the front under me and always displayed great bravery. I posted them at the most dangerous and difficult points and they always carried out the tasks allotted to them with great gallantry. They gave us a whole series of plays, dances, fights, farces, songs, and balalaikia orchestras. The men of the Czech Corps played an important part in this entertainment and contributed greatly to its gaiety. There was no great gaiety in Austria-Hungary. The Kaiser of Germany forced the Austrians to surrender their army to direct German military command. The government of Austria-Hungary at this point intended to pursue a peace deal under any circumstances, but they now had no political or military power. The U.S. ambassador to Austria described the mood in Vienna as complete and utter despair. This could have been good for Russia. It wasn't. Despite totally crippling the Austria-Hungary empire, Russia was now desperately short on food and manpower. The Russian army drafted a bunch of untrained peasants to make up numbers. Unwittingly, the government had signed its own death warrant. Unrest had been stirring in the Russian Empire since before the war. Wartime inflation and shortages just made it worse. The Russian government refused to negotiate with any labor leaders. Meanwhile, the Tsar was constantly hiring and firing ministers on the advice of Rasputin. In October 1916, the Department of Police warned a revolution might be in the works. Alexander Kerensky was widely known as a reasonable man. He led an opposition party in parliament, and it took a lot to make him angry. When the entire cabinet of Russian ministers walked out of parliament in the face of an angry crowd, he gestured to their empty chairs. He began a speech with, You must annihilate the authority of those who do not acknowledge their duty. They must go. And launched into a list of every failure of the current government, culminating in him screaming, Is this stupidity or treason? And, and here's this Sith Lord looking motherfucker, Alexander Kerensky. Look at this guy. He's either about to destabilize the balance of the force, or he's going to drop the most fire gothic new wave album of the 1980s yeah for real you know he kind of do you know the spider-man villain hammerhead he looks kind of like a live action hammerhead because he's got that flat hair hairdo you know <laughs> that hammerhead uses when he just like runs into people with the top of his head um yeah i love this guy uh i love his vibe I love the fact that he looks so grumpy that even when they're taking this photo of him, he can't just like ungrump for 30 seconds. Like, look at this motherfucker. That dude wakes up and it just, that's his, that's, he, this guy has resting bitch face and I love it. Yeah. He looks like he's an advisor on the council of the emperor from Star Wars. Like he's the guy that's like, the rebels are pushing back our forces in Glunkant. We must send more allegiances there. Or he's the third secret member of Tears for Fears. This motherfucker was in Bauhaus and then quit went into politics, rose through the uh, the imperial ranks, and became uh, definitely not Grima Wormtongue. The government immediately banned all copies of his speech, but they got around. Later, a general named Laver G. Kornilov would say of it, Without that manly and daring act, it would not be possible to arouse the proletariat and the army so unanimously. And also songs from the big chair just wouldn't have been the same. Shout, shout, 
let it all out. These are the government officials that we want out. Come on. I'm talking to you. Rise up. In modern times, you know we gotta save the Slavs. The Tsar dismissed another prime minister. The replacement got harangued in parliament, and a group of aristocrats shot Rasputin and threw him into a canal. The general public was outraged. Even though they hated Rasputin, he had worked his way up from an unemployed drunk in a small Siberian town to spiritual advisor to the royal family. A career that began with wandering from monastery to monastery with only one set of clothes had led to a position where he could eat, drink, and fuck his way through all of the Russian high society. If a nobleman acted sketchy and gave bad advice, he'd be dismissed from his political position. Rasputin acted sketchy and gave bad advice, and he got killed for it. It seemed unfair. In February of 1917, Tsar Nicholas left St. Petersburg to go command his army personally. When the temperature got above freezing, people took to the streets. Striking workers set up on the scenic avenues of that great city and got real comfortable there. This quickly evolved into clashes with the police. Then people started burning police stations. Then the military got called in. They killed a couple dozen people. Then it got quiet. It was quiet because the rioters were trying to convince the military garrison to join their side. It started on Sunday, and by Monday, 80,000 of the city's 160,000 soldiers had flipped. The Tsar's cabinet tried to resign en masse, but the Tsar refused to let them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if, like, at the height of, like, the 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 police protests in 2020, and I think a little bit into 2021, all these protests are going around the country and also globally. There was all there was all these like uh, clashes between protesters and police, and then like also like uh, counter protesters. There was fights, and a couple, pe- couple people died in a few areas. If like at the at the height of that, most of the police were just like, you know what, you're right, and then they just like started like fighting the fucking fascists with the protesters if only bro if only when i was in france when i was in france it was interesting because the vibe was like half that and then half just like boot licking so like you would go from block to block during the manifestations and sometimes the cops and the firefighters would be protesting with the 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 people and then you'd get to a different block and it was just a totally different vibe and there were all these fucking like SWAT looking, you know, French military national police t- style dudes with like, you know, shields and batons and riot gear. And it was like, oh, these guys are not they are These guys are not chill, bro. These are we got to get the fuck out of here. It was really weird. Yeah, we, we've talked about this on another episode, but that yeah, that was when I was in France and Italy, the military presence there is jarring. Like whatever problems you have, like anybody has about the US, like you don't just like go out and see like five dudes with assault rifles at a park. Just like being like, oh, I'm just kind of standing here looking at the clouds. But you know, if you get if you get out of, if you get out of line, I'm going to fucking spaghettify you. We just have five random civilians with machine guns. Oh, yeah, yeah. Parks. Uh, outside of Dunkin' Donuts being like, better not try to buy donuts, transgenders. The donut holes are for the boys and the regular donuts with the holes are for the girls. That's a That was like the dumbest thing I could think of. And it's probably real. It's totally a thing. I hundred, I a hundred percent think that that is a real thing. I think that that you just like willed that into existence. Yeah. By this time, a group of rioters, mostly composed of mutinous soldiers, had set up an organization called the Petrograd Soviet. Petrograd was Saint Petersburg changed to sound less German. It quickly started calling delegates from other Russian revolutionary movements. Like they got, they got shit done. Yeah, it's interesting. I I just listened to uh, the podcast series. Um, all about the weather underground that was produced by the son of the main woman who like put together the the movement called um, Mother Country Radicals. And I, I like that period in history and I am fascinated specifically with the weather underground. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll learn some stuff I didn't know. Turns out, yeah, I learned a bunch of stuff I didn't know from that because it's all these interviews with all of the people that were there at the founding of the, the weathermen and also were there <laughs> through it going little sideways and when it kind of fell apart and got taken over by even more extreme leftists and it's so stark the difference between that and this where the american version of like protesting the system trying to take down a corrupt government and um you know voicing our dissent over how members of our country are being treated is like 
it starts out with marching through the streets and then ends with like blowing up a soak soap factory <laughs> you know like that's that's the only thing we got it's like i don't know let's just blow up a soap factory where these motherfuckers are like coordinating with multiple cells having you know behind the scenes butler manipulation political you know dossier smuggling campaigns like fucking wild yeah if that if a, if we if it's blowing up a soap factory mo- most modern american dissident organizations are just like it's like it's like anonymous anonymous is like we're anonymous we'll hack everybody but then like we kind of just don't actually do that and we really have never accomplished anything yeah the 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 weather underground situation is fascinating too because at a certain point it kind of just like devolved into being a cult where people were so consumed with deprogramming themselves about patriarchal thought and deprogramming themselves about racist thought that they started having these like weekly shamathons that would then devolve into orgies where every x you know number of people would be picked and they would be put up and they would have to explain how their thinking or their life benefited from being white or how horrible their thought patterns were and they would be like literally publicly shamed and sometimes abused and beaten for their these thoughts that they were having or these means by which they had accrued privilege which would then manifest as them they all get super horned up about it yeah not necessarily being forced to have sex with people to break taboos but not not forced being sex being forced to have sex it's pretty it's it's very interesting to see how so many of these positive progressive ideas just spool up and spool up and spool up until you become this just like insane parody of what you actually think because you're attempting to um, create an environment that can foster real, writ large, scalable change. Um, it's fascinating, especially when after the, all of these terrorist attacks that they committed happened and then they this the cells splinter and people are in hiding for literally 30 and 40 years working dead-end jobs raising kids having families it's wild wild stuff jerking off thinking about their white privilege maybe that's the maybe that's the reason this worked is because fucking what's his face his wife was like kept from him like this was all just his thing being like i gotta fuck bro i gotta take down this government so i can fuck i'm telling you that was that was it that was fucking it that he he had that one motivator and it 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 pulled it pushed him through it pulled it all together he's like he's like listen to me listen to me fucking uh slavonic and durek and uh that sigmund freud looking motherfucker don't fuck this up for me if any of you fuck up i will fucking murder you and i will i will murder you after almost murdering you 10 times i will almost murder you and then just barely let you live and then i'll do that 10 times and then i'll fucking murder you i will go full ceo of costco on you and the, and they did it it's like don't fuck this up for me I ain't, I ain't down with them babushkas. He just c- goes into the office the, in the morning and he's like, California girls. <laughs> what are you, what's going on, dude? What's going on? Dude, oh, nothing. I'm just thinking about how I'm going to like, top. yeah, I'm just thinking about how I'm going to fucking smash it. He goes into their dissident, their <laughs> dissident revolutionary office, just like California girls, California. They're just like, like, <laughs> they're all standing there watching them and then just like a tear rolls down Durek's eye and he's like we're gonna win this for him <laughs> we gotta get this guy some <laughs> California <laughs> montage of him riding the train into work listening to California girls and he's looking out the subway cars and he's seeing all of these women in babushkas and he's just turning his head like no nah. Oh, California girls. They're like, really? If for this anachronistic joke, it wasn't. I wish they all could be California girls by the Beach Boys. Nah, nah, bro. It's got to be that Katy Perry feet Snoop Dogg. Nicholas had ordered Parliament dissolved, but they formed a temporary committee to attempt to handle the current situation. Their original goal was not to form a new government, but people kept pledging allegiance to them. They met with the Petrograd Soviet to resolve the current situation. 
Together, they drafted a new constitution, made the Tsar abdicate, created a law that guaranteed freedom of assembly and speech, and declared a new Russian provisional government. Unwittingly, they also redeemed the full value of the death warrant the previous government had signed. See, the Temporary Committee and the Petrograd Soviet had agreed on a few other things. Namely, they agreed to release all political prisoners, replace the Russian police with new untrained militias, and disband all local governments. There were no interim measures in place to ensure a transition of power. The old order was just gone, and there was nothing to replace it. When they drafted all those peasants into the Russian army after the Brusilov Offensive, the previous government had taken a bunch of freezing, starving young men at the age when people have the least to lose, and give most of their harvest to landowners who didn't work, sent them to reinforce a total overextended front line, made them hang out with guys who had seen most of their friends killed, and a bunch of weapons manufacturing workers who had been striking on and off since before the war, and then given them weapons, rations, ammo, and uniforms, but not enough to actually fight the war with. Then their successors dissolved the government. Was this stupidity or treason? A government performs certain functions related to making sure most people can get food, keeping the roads open, keeping the lights on, and ensuring people won't get robbed or killed most of the time. If the government is not doing those things, other people will find ways to make those things happen, and those people will become the new real government. Faced with all this chaos, the Czechoslovak independent movement in Russia set about making its own government. They finally cut Durek and his supporters fully out of their business, and reincorporated themselves as a branch of Masaryk's National Council in Paris. The Druzina was now free from Russian control and truly the army of Czechoslovakia. The last Czech and Slovak POWs could leave prison and join them, and the quest for statehood could enter its next phase. A Hungarian POW described what the mood was like in his camp when they got news of the February revolutions. Their, quote, military prison was actually an abandoned hotel with no heat in the small town of Erbit. A group of drunk prison guards stumbled into the courtyard, carrying their boots and firing shots into the air. They passed around bottles of vodka with the prisoners and sang songs from the French Revolution as they celebrated the Tsars' rest and oncoming end of the war. The camp's old commandment was leading men in an impromptu parade around the yard with a red banner aloft. They took down the barbed wire and guard and prisoner alike were able to go free. The problem was that they were in a small Siberian town and the only way out would be the trains. Whenever one started up, soldiers swarmed it, filling it beyond capacity. Bodies would accumulate outside railway tunnels where people riding on the roofs of train cars had fatal impacts with the top of the tunnel. Soon the railways were littered with corpses and wrecked trains. This is another thing to put into perspective. Like, imagine if there was sweeping prison reform in the United States, which, for the record, absolutely should happen. But if it just kind of happened out of nowhere and they were like, all right, uh, private prisons are now illegal and uh, they all have to shut down. And then they just like opened all the prisons. And I'm not, I'm not saying that in a way of like, oh, the, the, the town, the, you know, the country would be overrun with crime and, you know, criminals. I, but like the mass chaos of like thousands and thousands of people who just like have no like established like transitionary thing to go to. Like they're just like, oh, you're, you're leave now. Get out of this prison. And like they have nowhere to live, they have nowhere to go necessarily. They don't have any like they don't have they have no jobs. Like imagine the fucking chaos that would be if that happened. Where they just open the doors one day and we're just like, y'all got to get out of here. Closing time. I feel like that's what life Arizona is. It's just like criminals just running amok, being like, hey kid, want some meth? That's that's just that's they would all go to Arizona. They'd be like, that's that's fucking Shangri La for methed out prisoners. Also, in, in a very real way, this kind of happened in the 1980s whenever Ronald Reagan passed the laws that basically made it where um, uh, psychiatrists that he raised the number of hours that you had to train, like train in order to be a licensed psychiatrist. And so a bunch of these people who ran these like mental institutions and homes suddenly just no longer had a license because they didn't pass this threshold. And so they had to just like close down all these mental mental institutions and just like let all these mentally ill people just they they were just homeless like they just became they transitioned to becoming homeless that just like happened like one day and we, we still feel the effects of it to this day from the 1980s to now where there's obviously just a massive homelessness crisis and a lot of them are mentally ill and it's a benefactor of the fact that these people just were essentially kicked out of their houses. And they're well, not their houses, but they were kicked out of the place where they were receiving primary care 
and they just they just transition into being homeless people and that and the problem is and the, the problem has never really corrected itself the man who emerged on top of the provisional government catastrophe was foreign minister pavel milyakov his main problem was that general order number one on the petrograd soviet placed all the military forces in saint petersburg under their command given how many soldiers were already on their side it wasn't just hot air this was a problem because Milyakov announced the provisional government's intention to continue the war and, in fact, increased Russian territorial goals. Among other things, he wanted Istanbul, a.k.a. Constantinople. If you are either brushed up on your history, brushed up on your they-might-be-giant lyrics, or brushed up on your Tiny Toon Adventures episodes featuring They Might Be Giants lyrics. Pushback was immediate. Rioters took to the streets demanding peace without annexations or indemnities. And the chaos continued. Russia had a war, but no state. The Russian people had come together to get rid of the Tsar. And now that the Tsar was out, it was clear no one had a plan. By the summer of 1917, though, four people with very big plans were on their way to Russia. Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Leon Trotsky, and Tomas G. Masaryk. The first three were returning political exiles representing different factions of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Lenin and Stalin were in the Bolsheviks. Trotsky was in the Mensheviks. The key difference is that the Mensheviks were more open to working with other parties and at the time were popular. The Bolsheviks thought they were soft. Tomas G. Masaryk was traveling under the pseudonym Thomas George Miller. He come to Russia to assess the situation and direct his army and also make road warrior and then happy feet. <laughs> He made an agreement with a French diplomat to give his newly stateless army some legitimacy. Czechoslovak soldiers would be incorporated into the French army as part of the French Foreign Legion, hence the Czechoslovak Legion. The French Foreign Legion is one of those things that I I just nebulously know about because it's like referenced in cartoons a lot. Like, I, and I don't even I can't even like pinpoint one specific one. But there was just a thing. It, it became a trope where in like cartoons and like maybe just like shows, it was a thing where if somebody like wanted to run away from home or like got into trouble and was trying to escape, they would be they would say that they were going to go join the French Foreign Legion. And that's like primarily what I know that from. Also, I feel like I've watched a bunch of movies that are like maybe they're World War One movies. I don't know. But they're, the French Foreign Legion is always depicted as like coming in and saving the day and they have interesting hats. That's all I really remember. Yeah, and I, I guess the thing is that it's just it's a it's a it's a French military that basically allows like ex, expats from other countries, and if you join it, like you can come live in France without going through the other legal channels of immigration. Sign me up right now. Let's go. I'm turning this off. The Russian army was in a very bad position in the summer of 1917. The empire fielded 15 million soldiers in total during the war, and 55% were dead, wounded, or in enemy prisons. The dead alone made up 1.3 million men. General Mikhail Alexeyev had to go to St. Petersburg and tell the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet that the Russian army was defeated. The provisional government's minister of war, Alexander Kerensky, decided to bet the war on one last all-or-nothing dice roll, despite threats that the men would kill their general if he ordered another offensive. They gathered together the surviving loyal soldiers of the decimated Russian regiments, grouped them together as shock battalions, and supported them with as much artillery as they could scrape together. One of these shock battalions was made of three rifle regiments from the Czechoslovak Legion. They fought well. At the Battle of Zuborov, they broke through three successive fortified enemy trenches and captured more than 3,000 Austro-Hungarian soldiers and 15 artillery pieces. One soldier recalled, I approached the enemy with 10 grenades, and the first rifle came from the Austrian I took it from. Two of the Austro-Hungarian regiments were majority Czech, and many of their soldiers just defected to the Legion once they realized whom they were fighting. The fame they earned at Zuborov led to a new influx of POWs signing up for their ranks. The Russian army, on the other hand, would never recover. Another 170,000 Russians were dead or wounded. 230,000 had been taken prisoner. 55% of Russian losses were soldiers that simply surrendered to the enemy. So many soldiers pretended to be sick that illness reports rose 200%. The popularity of the Bolsheviks skyrocketed, as they were the only political party willing to advocate immediate peace at any cost. The German Empire led to a counteroffensive in July of 1917, the Russian front line collapsed. A Bolshevik soldier described it as such. 
Authority and obedience exist no longer. Persuasion and admonition produce no effects. Threats and sometimes shots are the answer. For hundreds of miles, one can see the deserters, armed and unarmed, in good health and high spirits, certain they will not be punished. Back in St. Petersburg, the situation was getting worse. With even more protests on the streets and Bolshevik popularity on the rise, Kerensky started sending raids against the Bolsheviks. Lenin fled to Finland. Trotsky got caught. Stalin disappeared into the underworld of St. Petersburg. When the prime minister resigned, Kerensky took his job without giving up his position as minister of war. He moved into the Tsar's winter palace, where soldiers camped out in the ballrooms and hung their laundry off the walls. He ordered General Kornilov to attack the garrison of the Petrograd Soviet and demanded his ministers make him dictator. Then he fired Kornilov by telegram. Dang, the, the breakup text? Damn, he got that breakup text, bro. He got that, I'm not feeling it anymore. You aren't even worth saying this in person. And there's going to be like some emojis in this shit. Like a little like, it's not you, it's me with a little like, a little like crying emoji, hard eye emoji, and then prayer hands emoji. Kornilov refused to stand down. He attempted to raise the army in a revolt to depose Kerensky, disarm the Petrograd Soviet, and save Russia. Germany was closing in and their state was collapsing from the inside. This wasn't about right and wrong. This was their last shot at survival. He wrote his plea as an open letter to the newspaper Novo Vremia. People of Russia, our great country is dying. Her end is near. Forced to speak openly, I, General Kornilov, declare that the provisional government under the pressure of the Bolshevik majority and Soviets is acting in complete harmony with the German general staff and is killing the army and shaking the country. The terrible conviction of the inevitable ruin of the country compels me in these frightful times to call upon all Russians to save their dying land. All in whose breast is a Russian heart that beats, all who believe in God, in the church, pray to him for the greatest miracle, the saving of our native land. I, General Kornilov, son of a Cossack peasant, declare to one and all that I desire nothing for myself other than the salvation of our great Russia, and vow to lead the people through victory over our enemies to the Constituent Assembly where it can determine its future destiny in the form of its future political life. I cannot betray Russia into the hands of her ancient enemy, the Germans, who would make slaves of the Russian people. I prefer to die honorably on the field of battle so that I may not see the shame of degradation of the Russian land. People of Russia, the life of our native land is in your hands. Their army did nothing, and he surrendered on September 1st of 1917. That makes it awkward. You 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 po publish this impassioned plea for people to rally up behind you, and they're just like, nah, and then you have to surrender. Like that's that's egg on your face. Couldn't couldn't you guys couldn't you guys couldn't just like humor me for a little bit? Just put up a little resistance. No, nothing. All right, cool, sick, 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 sick. sick. Yeah, that's a real Larry David moment. That that letter ended with. <laughs> Meanwhile, Masaryk was doing gangbusters recruiting for the Legion. He had multiple Czech and Slovak newspapers circulating the POW camps in both daily and monthly forms, and volunteers were joining in the thousands. In early 1918, the Legion numbered a little over 47,000 soldiers. And just and just to just to reiterate, this is like three dudes who were just like, you know what? Fuck this shit. Czechoslovakia for life, bitches. And then just like bootstrapped this shit, this whole thing. Yeah, it was real. The real rise and grind mindset paid off here. Yeah, hustle. These guys were hustlers. <laughs> this, this was hustle culture to the max. <laughs> he was just posting TikToks being like, I do the 100, 100, 100 method. I recruit 100 people into the new Czechoslovakian division of the Foreign Legion. And then I send 100 emails asking for people to donate money. And then I kill 100 motherfuckers who stand in my way because we're going to have a free Czechoslovakian state. God damn it. And then I think about my wife for 100 minutes. I'm here in the garage. I was just taking a, a, a buggy ride through the St. Petersburg Hills. But you know what's better than this this nice fancy carriage is revolution. I don't even call it I don't even I don't even call it revolution anymore. I call it freedom units. Of course, there is also the several coincidental and circumstantial um historical moments that happen to coincide with all of their uh, secret missions that kind of like all lined up in perfect place for this whole thing to be facilitated. So it wasn't just them doing it themselves. There was a bunch of crazy shit going on that just kind of happened to work out for them. But 
still crazy that they just like it's like three dudes it's like it's like four dudes and like one of them kind of was an asshole and they just did this whole thing and then the fourth dude was like Dave Mustaine getting kicked out of Metallica in their early days and then re- being replaced by uh Kirk Hammett Durek was was Dave Mustaine yeah but even so they still used a bunch of his solos and bullshit on those those records after he got kicked out mm-hmm. and then he went on to f- to form a not as successful but still very successful competitor band. He's still around. He's doing stuff. He's uh he's still around making uh music that I honestly prefer to Metallica and I I actually really love Megadeth and I I love I love the music but I also love the weird kind of like 1980 style conspiracy theory lyrics to them, but I would never want to actually meet or hang out with Dave Mustaine because there's no way he's not like a hardcore QAnon guy. He just seems like a fucking asshole just in general. Even aside from that, he just he does not give off chill dude vibes. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely someone where it's just like, I, I love I love your music. You've never done anything so bad that it would be like, oh, it's ethically wrong to listen to your music but i never want to meet you or talk to you or hear you talk about anything i'm, I'm glad to separate the art from the artist on that one the legion was a good way to escape the no longer supplied or maintained pow camps and be armed and supported in a dangerous country and they became very armed in late 1917 they were able to pick up three batteries of artillery deserting russians had left behind in ukraine but the pow's risked much more for the legion they had no reliable sources of supplies no notable generals, and no government support. The central powers considered them traitors, and the standing order was to never take a legionnaire alive. And they were trying to get almost three quarters of their number to France to re-enter combat against those same powers. Meanwhile, Vladimir Lenin was prepping the Bolsheviks to take power. The time for action was now. In his own words at the time, The peasant uprising did not wait. The war does not wait. He sent commissars to every military unit near St. Petersburg. These were political officers that would act as the authority of the Bolsheviks. Late in October, troops supporting Kerensky attempted to eject all the commissars from Russian high command. The Bolsheviks responded by sending out a militia called the Red Guards to seize strategic locations all over the city. They met little resistance. Lenin declared the provisional government overthrown and had his men capture the Winter Palace. Kerensky had already fled with his soldiers and the remaining officials surrendered without a fight. So here are the Red Guards. I dig these hats. These are these are some Russian guys. Yeah, these are these are, these are the most Russian people I've ever seen. Yeah, I like the hats. Leather jackets are cool. I like the fact that they seem to be holding both swords and rifles, all of them, which is fun. Got to have both. Got to have both. Uh, what do you think the delineation is between having those like more stereotypical communist soldier hats with the brim versus having the like square puffy fur hat? Because it's divided almost evenly. But what do you think the, the delineation is how those guys chose which hat they were going to rock? It's if your ears get a little chilly. <laughs> yeah. My little, my little tips, my little ears just get a little chilly sometimes. So I like, I like myself a little bit of a, I like to wear the little furry hat. But it's just, you know, it's just because my, my ears get a little chilly. If you zoom in on this guy in the middle, who's like squinting his eyes, and he's kind of got bangs, and you just cropped his head. That guy is just like, he's a singer songwriter who like has an indie band that has a name, but it's just him, you know, like that guy has a band called like by the fireside, but it's just him. While this was happening, Professor Masaryk was trapped in Moscow. He spent six days in a hotel besieged by Bolsheviks. While hiding out in Kiev, an artillery shell hit the room next to him but didn't explode. He saw the dead carried off in carts. The stiffened bodies were thrown like logs into little vehicles, and the head, and sometimes the hands, on the other. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, this, this fucking guy just, like, survived an artillery shell, like, getting shot into the room next to him, and then it just didn't detonate, so he didn't die. Like, that's, that's fucking crazy. He just willed it. He's like, he's like, no, I'm gonna get my California girl. No. Artillery shell bad. Artillery shell bad. No. He had, like, a little spray bottle. He's like, no. You don't do that. You don't do that. Out of here. No. You don't blow up. I still haven't. I still haven't reunited with my little California girl. I'm trying to see those Daisy Dukes, okay? Daisy Dukes and bikini on top. And the, the artillery shells like, you're right, man. I'm not, I won't deprive you of that. Back in St. Petersburg, the Bolsheviks began to set up a new government. Their goals, peace, land, and bread. At the city of Brest, they began negotiations with the central powers to surrender. They had no leverage for negotiation. 
Germany could make any demands they wanted and the Russians would have to comply because their state had collapsed. And that's how Germany won World War I, theoretically. They'd achieved all their war goals, but the Western nations of the Entente were still fighting. In autumn of 1917, the Bolshevik government issued the Declaration for the Rights of the Nations of Russia, which allowed the peoples of the former Russian Empire the right to form an independent state. One of the countries that did was Ukraine, where the Legion was encamped. It was now a battleground between Ukrainian separatists and pro-Soviet Red Guards. Masaryk desperately tried to keep his men out of the fighting, refusing to stay in Kyiv to help fight off the Germans. He cut a deal with the Bolsheviks to get his men away from the front, and sent a copy of the agreement to the French government, with the note, a proof that it is possible to do business with the Bolsheviks. Meanwhile, Leon Trotsky was trying to make the negotiations with Russia last as long as possible. He thought if he delayed long enough, there would be communist revolutions in Germany and Austria that would force the central powers out of the war. When the Germans made a separate peace deal with a new government in Ukraine, Trotsky insisted there be neither war nor peace. In the words of German General Max Hoffmann, we were all dumbfounded. Germany sent 600,000 troops to help their new ally Ukraine kick the Bolsheviks out. The Czechoslovaks were still Germany's mortal enemies, and now the chase was on. Legionnaires fled eastward mostly on foot, crossing as much as 96 miles a day through snow and ice to outrun the German army in a desperate attempt to flee Ukraine. That's when things got interesting. But the story isn't over yet. There's still more thrilling espionage, globe-trotting action, and political intrigue in the quest to topple the great European empires and establish the nation of Czechoslovakia. Next week on episode two of The Greatest War Story Never Told. This episode was written by special guest writer Louis Paggi. If you'd be interested in writing an episode of Deep Cuts, email us at andrew at boygeniusmedia.com. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com.